So who among us would deny that literacy is vital for survival in the modern world? Without literacy, we simply flounder. We can't navigate the culture. We impose a burden on everyone else, and all sorts of precious things would grind to a halt without the lubricant of literacy to keep them rolling. Democracy, commerce, education. So literacy is, is just something that we, we value in society. And the competencies that we lump into this notion of literacy extend far beyond mere facility with language. So there are many forms of literacy. Some of them are, are on the way out. For example, the Stone Age literacies involved in napping flint and making atlatls. They're nearly gone, if not completely extinct. And I challenge anyone to find someone who cares. It simply doesn't matter. But many of us do care very much about technological literacy, the ability to use computers and navigate the information superhighway. So I want to talk today about a form of literacy that is, I believe, very much under-discussed. And this is what's come to be called landscape literacy. The ability to read and interpret and hear the stories that wild landscapes present to us. So, the woes of nature before the relentless advance of civilization are, are nearly a cliche, where if you're awake, you're simply inundated with, with this information. And um, oftentimes it can be very depressing. So I actually will not be talking about that today at all. What I wanted to point out is that something that's not well appreciated is that along with the species and ecosystems and habitats that we lose, we're also losing something much closer to home. We're losing the stories. We're losing the ability to engage with the texts that carry those stories, which is landscape literacy. So, hunter-gatherers have exceptional landscape literacy. They, they simply have this magical ability to, to read the landscape. And as people began to abandon the hunter-gatherer lifestyle. They, they began to also uh, and, and domesticate plants and animals and, and build cities and create civilizations. They also began to lose something essential um, in that connection to nature. They began to lose bit by bit the skills and knowledge that go along with reading a landscape. So um, it turns out that since the beginning, people have, have understood that, that there's this trade-off. And so um, this is, is beautifully expressed in one of the most ancient, perhaps the first great work of literature that our species possesses, the Epic of Gilgamesh. This is a story that's well over 4,000 years old from Mesopotamia. And it tells the story of a great king, Gilgamesh, of the city of Uruk. And uh, Gilgamesh, to proclaim his glory to the world, decided he needed higher walls and bigger towers and um, more massive ziggurats. And so he, he knew that to do this, he needed commodities like wood. And he knew that in a distant mountain, there was a, a pristine old growth cedar forest from which he thought he could get wood. So he set off with his sidekick Enkidu and traveled to this distant mountain. And when he entered the cedar forest, he was just, they were just awestruck. They, they sat there with their mouths open, just staring at the, this beautiful old growth forest. And they were, they were overcome with awe for a while. And then they remembered why they'd come. And they started to chop down the cedar trees. And this enraged the demon spirit, Humbaba, who guarded the forest. And Humbaba came at them. And there was an epic battle. And Humbaba was vanquished and killed. And then his head was cut off. And then Gilgamesh and Enkidu could continue their process of harvesting the cedar trees for the, the glory of Uruk. However, there's this fascinating interlude in the story in which as Humbaba falls and is killed, their, their consciousness is fragmented. They become confused, disoriented, fearful. Chaos descends. 
And this is really a, a poignant expression, even from these earliest of urbanites, about how, yes, we can conquer nature and extract from it the commodities we need to make civilization great. But maybe, just maybe, in so doing, we lose something. Is it possible that that we risk losing an essential aspect of our human identity in our pursuit of commodities as we retreat from nature and nature retreats from us. So um, we continue to conquer landscapes in culturally specific ways, even today. And so we continue on this path of losing bit by bit those skills and knowledge that make up landscape literacy. And some years ago, I thought I would conduct some, some research and sort of figure out what the state of landscape literacy was among a group of urban high school kids. And so as part of this research, among other things, we asked a simple question, which you all can ask of yourself if you want right now. And the question was, can you name three birds and three plants from your backyard who were there before your backyard was your backyard. So in other words, three native and indigenous plants and birds. So I'm not going to ask for your answer to this, but the high school group that I surveyed, um, I was shocked by the, by the response. So it turns out that a mere 9% of the students could name three birds, and only 6% could name three plants. To me, this was just a, a vivid example of the failure to maintain even basic landscape literacy, at least in this population of urban, urban high school people. It seems that we're experiencing a cataclysm of, of lost distinctions. We're losing the landscape literacy. So it turns out that Not everyone cares. So to me, this, this, this landscape literacy is like, th th this study showed to me that it's like if you lived in a neighborhood and you knew none of your neighbors, you didn't know their names, you didn't know where they came from, how long they'd lived there, you had no idea who you were living with. That seems like a dire a dire warning to me, but, but not everyone is concerned. Some people say, does this really matter? Is it important? Isn't landscape literacy really just a euphemism for another obsolete Stone Age literacy that we can do without? I mean, do we sophisticated modern people really need to know anything about plants and birds and all that kind of stuff? And we're talking plants and birds, not lizards and spiders and worms and things, more obscure elements of nature. Can't we just go hiking once in a while? Isn't this really something, isn't this landscape literacy really just something that privileged people do on weekends? And if we really want to see nature interact with landscapes, why don't we just turn on the TV or go on the, on the online? We can see all kinds of pictures of lions and elephants and sharks and all kinds of stuff. Well, it turns out there's an essential flaw in this line of reasoning. And the flaw is that we evolved in landscapes. We are creatures of landscapes. And we have most definitely not evolved beyond our need for these landscapes. The great naturalist and scientist E.O. Wilson coined the term biophilia to describe this urge. Biophilia is an innate affinity for nature that all humans have. It's in our genes, it's hardwired in our genes to have this urge to interact with nature and to develop landscape literacy. So without even basic landscape literacy, we become lost, we become marginal citizens on our own planet. And in fact, just as a tree squirrel would be lost in an environment without trees, when we lose those stories that landscapes tell to us, we're losing something essential in our human identity as well. 
So this is why we go to zoos. This is why we go to botanical gardens. This is why we go hiking on weekends. And this is why this flower is beautiful to all of us. This flower evolved to impress an insect. And yet, inexplicably, it impresses all of us as well. So it may be, and this is, this is a huge topic, but it may be that our, our biophilia phenomenon, this urge to interact with nature, is much more profound than, we've, than we understand. And I believe that we'll, we'll understand this better in the future, but for now, we have just this rudimentary understanding. And it began in 1984 when a pioneering study was done, published in the journal Science. And this study showed that post-operative patients in a hospital who could see trees out of their window had a significantly shorter recovery time and needed fewer pain medications than patients recovering from the exact same surgery in the same hospital who could only see buildings out of their window. So even just seeing a landscape out of your window, a wild landscape, led to greater healing, happier, more, more happiness. And then a, a, a growing body of literature since then has shown that access to landscapes, to wild landscapes, has amazing abilities to change our physiology and our psychology. It's been shown that symptoms of ADHD are reduced in children who have access to, to wild landscapes. Domestic violence is reduced. Crime is reduced. Drug addiction is reduced. This is an area of active research. So we know that this is, is, is a very profound aspect. And it may be that we can never be fully happy as humans. We can never be fully realized humans without this aspect. Just as we need connection to other people, we apparently need this connection to nature. However, my thinking on this subject changed one day and not because of these practical considerations. So it may be that there are many practical good reasons for landscape, for, for encouraging landscape literacy. But my thinking changed one day. It was a beautiful, warm fall day in California. And I took a group of graduate students to a river where salmon were spawning. And before we began our activities, which would have been sciency. I asked them to do something that they were unfamiliar with. And some of them had never actually done this at all. I asked them to simply sit for half an hour in a spot and observe, and then record their observations. So the students found places to sit on the rocks along the river, and they observed. And when the half hour was up, I asked them to share what they'd found what they'd experienced. And many of them had looked at flowers, individual flowers or leaves, and been just impressed with them, just, just raptly attentive to these little details. Other people had looked at the landscape across the river. Some people had sat and watched the, the dying salmon splashing around in the shallows. And nearly all of the students accessed this, this wonder and this awe about being in nature and observing. Some of the students said that they wrote poetry for the first time ever, although they wouldn't share it. However, as the students were telling me about their experience of awe and wonder, I began to wonder if wonder, as wonderful as it is, is enough. Because I realized that these students really didn't understand what they were seeing at all. So for example, the students sitting along the, the, the riverbank on the rocks thought that these were just conveniently placed rocks that nature had put there for them. In fact, they were piles of rocks made by miners who had completely disrupted the ecology of the river in their quest for gold. And the students were impressed with Spanish broom, which was flowering. And admittedly, it is a, a charismatic plant. But I also knew it to be an invasive weed, which while we were sitting there enjoying it along the river, we were also spending a lot of money to try to remove from the river as a weed. 
None of the students noticed any of the native plants growing in the rocks along the riverbank, and none of the students noticed this beautiful shorebird, a black-bellied plover that had just arrived from the Arctic and was preening itself, ready to spend the winter along the river. So I realized as much as, as awe and wonder are wonderful, and as, as important as those are as a gateway, they don't constitute actual literacy. The students really had no understanding of what they were seeing in any real way. It's almost as if an illiterate person went to the library for the day, and when they left, they said, those books were amazing. They had all kinds of colors and textures, and look at the way they fit on the shelf. But they didn't understand a single word that was in those books. How much of the richness of the world were people missing in their awe and wonder? So I, I believe that we shouldn't stop at awe and wonder. Well, there is some good news. The good news is that landscape literacy, basic landscape literacy, does not need any kind of special education. You don't have to enroll in a class. It doesn't take hard work. And it's accessible to all of us. All one needs to do is go out and notice what's around you. Open your eyes and your ears. Begin to see and experience who you share your local environment with. When you start to do this, you'll notice things that intrigue you. You'll notice things that have been captivating people since we originated as a species. And when you start to do that, you'll start to, to, to have questions appear to you, come to you. You'll start to wonder, what is that plant? Is it edible? Is it poisonous? Where did it come from? How did it get here? Can I eat it? And then as you develop more questions, you'll start to look for answers. And eventually, you'll see that the landscapes that you can experience, and even in the most urbanized environments, you can see landscapes. There are always weeds and butterflies and insects and birds and things like that. They're always there. You'll begin to see that these landscapes have this, this rich interconnection of biology and history and cultural relevance. And then you become landscape literate. So I encourage all of you, as you go about your activities, occasionally turn over a rock. Who knows what would be underneath that rock? Maybe there's a field by your house that you've never walked out in before it's developed. You never know what you'll find. So just as language literacy opens up worlds of ideas to us, I would argue that Landscape literacy opens up worlds of experience to us, many of which are bound to be sustaining, maybe life-altering, and certainly unexpected. Thank you.